So I think I've mentioned that uh, when I was in high school, I went on two two-week mission trips, one right after my sophomore year and one right after my junior year, or no, was it right before my sophomore year? Anyways, it was sometime in high school that I went on these two trips. One was to uh, just outside of Kiev, Ukraine, and one was to about 12 hours away from Moscow in a direction I don't remember in a town called Yashkorola. And there were three things that I experienced on these trips to Eastern Europe that were really incredibly different. The cheesecakes, the toilets, and the gifts. Now the cheesecake was good, but you know how our cheesecake is very sweet? Their cheesecake is not. It's a very like sour, curdy kind of cheesecake. And once I got used to it, it was really good, but that first bite when I'm expecting a nice, sweet, rich cheesecake and I take a bite and it's not, it's very different. The toilets you can ask me about after the sermon if you're really curious. But needless to say, they were different. But the gifting was the one that confused me the most because everything is reciprocal. If you give someone a gift, they have to give you one back. And I wasn't used to that. See, especially to high school me, I thought a gift is a gift. You give a gift and that's just how it works. If I want to give you something, I don't expect anything in return, but in the Ukraine, if I give you something, there's a trade involved. It becomes this strange relationship thing that I don't fully understand the sociology of, but I remember distinctly accidentally hurting some poor kid's feelings because I gave him a Bible and he wanted to give me this chess set that he loved and was dear to him. And I'm like, I can't take that. And of course the kid was crushed because in their culture, gifting works in that way. You give each other something, but I wanted to just give the kid a Bible. I was very confused. Then as I got older, I realized that we do in fact have a similar sense of obligation when it comes to gifting. We can see it in how we do Christmas and birthday gifts like, let's see, so-and-so got me a gift for $20 last Christmas, so I need to get at least a $20 gift for them this Christmas, unless they give me a $30 gift, in which case I'm going to look bad, so I need, maybe I should give like a $25 gift just to be safe. I mean, have we ever played those games? It's just, it's not even something that we really do consciously. It's just kind of like, oh, I need to get stuff for, this, for these people because that's the expectation. A lot of times we view God's law in this way. I've even preached this before and I feel kind of bad about it now. That God does amazing stuff for us and then we have to give back to him by following the law. But the more I've come to understand the law, I think I've got it wrong. Because... If God does something for us out of his grace, if he's giving us a gift, why should we have an obligation to do something back? That doesn't make sense. If the gift comes with an obligation, is it really a gift? Aren't I just getting paid then? I mean, if I do work, like for, for me, it's at the church, but for other people, it's at your job. If you do work for your job, you get paid for it. You get paid because you did the work. But when you get a card from someone and it has a check in it, you didn't work for that check. The check's a gift, the other one's work. And I think the more that we try to say things like we respond to God by following the law, then that makes it work and we start to have a problem. Because I think what the law is really about, all of these commandments that God gave us, the ones we read, 10 of them today, I don't think they're so much meant to tell us how to respond to God. They're not meant to tell us what God expects of us, but instead they describe what a person who's following God will act like. 
I know that's a weird little distinction, but I think it's an important distinction. Because the way that we interact with God isn't like, it's not like there's a balance sheet where we have so many sins on one side and God has so much grace on the other side and God takes his grace and pays for our sins and I don't, I don't, think, it, I don't think that's all there is because that just makes our lives down to accounting. And some people really love accounting, but I try to avoid accounting as much as I possibly can, which bites me in the butt around tax time, but what do you do? But so these, but what I think God is really looking for is not for us to try to keep our balance sheet down. God wants us to actually spend time with God. Because when Jesus called his disciples, he didn't say, come follow the law. He said, come follow me. Our call as Christians is not to follow the law, it's to follow God. But as we follow God, we will follow the law. Following the the law doesn't mean we're following God, but following God means we just will be following the law. The law describes a person who is following God. Does that make sense? It's weird. It's a little different than what we might be used to. But I think it's important. Because I think if we treat the law as anything other than a description of what a person who follows God is like, the law can very easily become legalism. The sense that we have to do these things for us to be good Christians. We have to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we have to love our neighbor as ourself. Or else we're not a good Christian. That's a dangerous way to look at things, right? Because I don't know about you, but I imagine that if I say this, we'll all pretty much agree. I don't always love God with everything that I am, and I definitely don't always love my neighbor like I love myself. But I want to. I want to follow God. I don't always, but I want to. And I think that's what God's looking for. I remember some weird church growth thing that I went to years and years ago. And it was talking about a bullseye. And the way we tend to view church is you've got this bullseye. And on the outside is the people who are outside the church. And then the closer you get to the middle of the bullseye is the people who are better Christians than everybody else. It was like core core crowd or community. There were all kinds of weird names for it. But then I remembered somebody else who was looking at that and went, I don't like that. And he started drawing arrows all over this bullseye. So, he's, and he's going, what if you're in the middle, but your arrow is pointing out? That's probably not good. You can look like you're a great Christian, but if your arrow is pointing away from God, eh? But if you're... But what if you're on the outside, but your arrow is pointing towards God? I feel like that's better than someone who just looks like they're doing all the right things than someone who is actually striving after God. And I think that's what the law is all about. The law is about showing us what someone who is seeking after God looks like, especially when the Holy Spirit is done with them. Because if we treat the law like a thing that we're supposed to follow, then we end up in a big mess. Because when we look at things like the Ten Commandments, you start to have a problem. The first problem of which is, what are they? Did you know that if if I am in this church and I ask somebody what the Fifth Commandment is, and then I go over to the Presbyterian Church and I ask them what the Fifth Commandment is, they'll tell me a different commandment? Everybody numbers them different. Nobody, we can't even agree what 10 are the 10 commandments as Christians. So do you think we'll figure out how do we live by the 10 commandments if we can't even figure out what they are? See where it's handy to view the law not as a prescription, but a description. 
Because everybody's lists are different and everybody's prescribing something a little bit different. That and of course, if we treat the Ten Commandments as things that we're supposed to do, like, okay, well today I'm supposed to not have any other gods before me, we'll never get past the first one. Because that's just how we are as people. But if we treat them as a description, as I follow God, I won't be worshiping any other gods. That one kind of makes a little bit more sense. As I follow God, I will keep the Sabbath. I'll keep a time for me to spend time with God as I'm following God. As I'm following God, I'll honor my parents. As I'm following God, I won't kill, steal, commit adultery. I won't want other people's stuff. I won't bear false witness. Because as we seek after God, the Holy Spirit works in us to make these things happen, to make us more like Christ, who perfectly fulfilled the law. Because it's hard to keep the law. It's hard for us to juggle all of these things and say, oh, well, I don't want to break this law and I don't want to break this law. It's hard enough to keep love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as ourselves. That's why it's the first, that's why that's what we confess every single Sunday. I haven't loved God and I haven't loved my neighbor. But if we seek after God, if we're seeking after God every single day, then today I love God and my neighbor a little more than I did yesterday. And I hope that tomorrow I'll love God and my neighbor a little bit more. Because that's how it works. Because as we're following God, as we are seeking after the one who calls us to follow him, he makes us more like the kind of person the law describes. He makes us into the kind of person who won't just not kill people, but who will help those who are in need. Because as Luther describes in his large catechism, if breaking the fifth commandment is even something as not helping someone who needs it. And as we follow God, with God at our center, then everything else with the law falls into place. Because it's not so much that we need to always be loving God with everything that we are, because God will help us love him more every day. It's not that we always have to love our neighbor. God will make us love our neighbor more and more every day. It's a different way of thinking about the law, but I think it helps to take some of the pressure off. Because it means that I don't have to change myself to follow the law. I don't have to be responsible for me keeping all of these commandments. All I have to do is follow God. And God takes care of the rest. God takes care of making me more like Christ, of making me fit the kind of person who's in the law, the kind of person who does love God with everything they are, the kind of person who does love their neighbor as they love themselves. Because if I had to do it on my own, I know I couldn't. But with the Holy Spirit working in me, I know the Holy Spirit can do anything. So let's look at the law a little bit different. Not as a list of things that we must do but as a way of seeing the person whom God has for us to be, the person that God is making us into, a person who is like Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the law, the only person who has ever actually kept everything in the law. Because the law is talking about him. 
So let's live our lives not following these rules and regulations, but instead following Jesus Christ. Because as we follow Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will help us to be the person that the law says we will be. Help us to be a person who loves God with everything that we are and that loves our neighbor as ourselves. Not because it's a command, not because it's a response, but it's because who we will become in Christ. Christ.